This is the Sports Line Podcast here on CHCH. I'm Bubba O'Neill. Welcome to the podcast. It shines a spotlight on teams, athletes, coaches, and executives that come from, reside, and are making their presence known in Southern Ontario. Today, someone who's had the rare opportunity to push it to the limit. In a race world dominated by Flash and Dash, this individual grinded out the long route to achieving his dream. Led by a passion that began with fixing cars alongside with his father, Tim Horaney earned the opportunity to test Formula 2000 cars. When the opportunity knocked, his talent led him to drives in Canadian Formula Ford, the Formula Renault Series, and was topped by drives in the FIA, GT Championship, and Formula Toyota Atlantic Series. With his knowledge and experience required her rainy transition from the drivers to the analyst seat and now he's the go-to source for f1 and indy car knowledge on tsn hey tim moraney it's awesome that you're joining us here on the sports line podcast really appreciate your time this is a topic that is so dear to my heart going way way back and and i know we you and i have never really met but going some years back we've been bouncing back and forth on social media so it's great to meet you and talk about something that you and i really really appreciate and love yeah thanks so much for having me i really appreciate it uh yeah, no, it's uh, it's been a long time, and I'm glad we finally got to meet uh, person to person, except for digitally, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's our world right now. Hey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah know, sure. Sure. I, I got to start with this way. You know what? You're a Canadian. Uh, we, we grow up with hockey as being the number one sport in in our lives, maybe as kids. But you were a little different. What was it about motor racing that attracted you first off when you were young? Ah. Uh... I think you know what like watching formula one with uh with my dad is probably like where it all sort of got started when I was really young and I remember just watching Ayrton Senna like he was the driver who you know I looked up to the most when I was a kid and uh just from there just trying to figure out ways of getting into you know racing you know when you're nine years old you don't really know where to start and we started with go karts and kind of worked our way worked our way up. We didn't have a lot of money, but mm-hmm. uh, you know, just basically got through on talent and connections and networking and right place, right time, and yeah, just making sure always executing uh, when the timing is is called upon you, kind of thing. And so, yeah, that's you know, it's it's a long journey, man. I could sit here for an hour and tell mm-hmm. you all of it but it would still just be skimming the surface clint so like yeah that's sort of like the cole's notes version right. of it <laughs> but but it's crazy you know you think about it because you look at say well use hockey for an example basketball there's a kind of preconceived arrow to go in okay you're 50 sure. and you go here you do this or whatever there's real no there isn't real a recipe really for um, um someone that's enjoying motorsports and wants to get to the highest level when you look at your career, I mean, and the things that you accomplished, is, is it pleasing for you? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, like there are some things like I would still like to go back and race. Like I, I would love to try and do uh, the Daytona 24 hours uh, uh, again. I would like to do uh, 24 hours of Le Mans. I'd like to try and, and get into that. Uh, so I still have a passion to go and compete and to race. Um, but again, you know, that all comes down to like finding a big sponsor, someone who's going to help you pay for it mm-hmm. and who can help sort of flip the bill, get you testing, uh, that stuff's all really, really important. If you, if I would want to go, if I were to go back car racing, I would have to have, you know, those things sort of behind me to get it done. Um, yeah, I think like for, just for me, it's, um, uh, you know, I, I played hockey, I played football, uh, basketball, and, you know, I think, like, I love basketball. It's probably, like, one of my favorite my favorite sports, and and so is football. Um, hockey, not so much. I don't, I never really followed hockey. I never mm-hmm. really had a passion for it. I didn't watch too much hockey either. Uh, and racing was just something that, I don't know. I was really attracted to. I, I can't really explain it. It just was something that I had this 
like urge to go and do it's hard to explain right. but it just felt like something i needed to do i guess i should say it that way <laughs> well you talked about guys like senna being you know integral to your career i mean we all know the the med the, the, the mystery the legend of Aaron yeah. senna and and, and on his unfortunate death and the legacy that he did leave was there anyone in Canada, you know, the Greg Moores, who unfortunately another one that we lost, uh, Carpentier, um, Tracy. Was there anyone there that you, you could consider local that, that you were like, hey, you know, he's doing it. I can do it. Um, yeah, that's a great question. You know, I never I never kind of looked at it that way because when I was kind of coming up, I looked at it. I, all, I guess it always felt like it was so far away and it never felt like it was totally within the realm of possibility, especially when you start hearing stories about where some drivers kind of like how they got there, the money that they had behind them to get there. Mm -hmm. And you were kind of just like, oh, wow, like we we don't have that kind of money. And it's kind of like this is an impossible, an impossible journey um, for us to, to, to go on. And I say us because, you know, was it was my family behind me and supporting me through all that, which was uh crucial you know i i don't know if i could have how far i could have gone without their without their help i mean um not so much financially more so on the encouragement side i would say um financially they did everything they could it uh nowhere near like we never had money that like the, the folks we raced against we just right. did not have that kind of money so i was fortunate to get on teams that had sponsorships and things of that nature but like i would say when i you know looked at you know patrick carpentier um tagliani tracy greg moore um but you know i i kind of was like wow you know they they got in through the players program back in the day uh that was a huge program for yes, it was younger drivers and we don't have anything like that in canada anymore and that was a huge pipeline for young talent in this country to, to to get into motorsports and to make their way, uh, I mean, if it wasn't for players, I mean, who's to say, you know, you know, Jacques Villeneuve gets the Formula One, and wow. who's to yeah. say that like Paul Tracy goes on to win a uh, a Champ Car championship, and who's to say that Patrick Carpentier even gets the Indy Car, so or Champ Car, I guess I should say. So it's it's um. It's something like that that I think we desperately need in our country again because there's a lot of talent that is that is here. Um, it's it's uh, yeah, it's motorsports is really difficult. But like, I guess to go back to your question, you know, the only drivers who who were up there who really helped, I would say, were probably the likes of Oriel Servia. Oh. Um, and Max Pappas was really, mm -hmm. uh, really very helpful. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. You know, like those were, for me, those, those guys were really helpful for me. They're incredibly accomplished uh, drivers in, in yeah. IndyCar and Champ Car, as you would say. I got to go real basic with you, okay? For <laughs> most of us and most of us that are, that are listening and watching here on this podcast, we're told to drive 100 kilometers. And sometimes we're, we're, we're you know, we got the opportunity to go 110. Well, some of us go a little bit more, maybe 120 to try and stay away to keep up with the traffic. What's it like driving beyond 120 kilometers an hour? Because you've reached some high speeds in some of the cars that you've been had, you've been fortunate to drive. What's that feeling for of speed? Uh, it's definitely a rush. Like it's a rush of adrenaline. There is no question about it. I think like the biggest thing that you notice is when you go from um when you move up formulas so when you when you're in let's just say i'll use myself for an example when you're in like formula renault mm -hmm. and then you take a step and you go to champ car atlantics which was indy lights or indy next now as they call it that gap between speed is is really big it's a big gap to to, to jump and so at the at the beginning it's very uh daunting and it's very like oh my god like how am i supposed to like handle this machine and wring its neck and put it on the limit when like I hit the accelerator and my brains are being blown to the back of my skull and it's like how am I supposed to do this and eventually you in in practice testing which is so crucial for a driver 
that's where you sort of start to build the confidence. You understand the machinery. You start to sort of inch towards the boundaries of what it can do. And then you kind of find out what you can do as a human. And then you have to find a way of overriding some of the things that you think aren't possible. So mm -hmm. you kind of have to push through that. You have to find a way of getting around um, what your brain's telling you. Because your brain will be like, nope, that's not possible. <laughs> it's like, well... Physics say it is, and then yeah. you kind of got to have this conversation with yourself like, no, no, you know, can do this, got to do it. We want to make this career, we got to do this, got to, you know, you got to push yourself and, and you find different ways of, of motivating and getting the best from yourself to, you know, uh, you know, go, go flat out through a corner where you don't think a, a car can handle it. And you've got to understand that once you do it once, you can do it every other time from then on right. it's convincing yourself to do it once because once you do it once it's scary as hell but then you get the confidence because you know the car can do it so then right. once you understand the car can do it then it becomes a little bit i don't want to say easier but you're able to get there a little bit more and aggression is is very helpful like you have to be aggressive mm -hmm. and uh, i would say you know like football and basketball like you pick and choose your moments to be aggressive, but in a race car, you always have to be like at that limit of aggression. Like it has to be very high. And I always tell drivers, it's better for you to be over aggressive um, than under aggressive because with an over aggressive driver, you can always sort of rein them in a bit. Right. With an under aggressive driver, it's hard to get them there. And, and the neat thing is too, you're doing it all with that mindset of that, there can be a dangerous situation that happens. How do you get over that? Or do well, you ever get over that? I, it's a great question and, and I get it a lot. I, um, as for me, I never think about it because <laughs> I don't, I don't believe that it's going to happen to me. And I don't think that anything can happen to me. And, and if it does, it does, but it's out of that's out of my control. What's in my control is my performance. What's in my control is what I do with the car, and what's in my control is, uh, you know, focus, concentration, and those things. Um, when you have an accident, you always want to understand why you had it, and you always want to learn from the incident because if you don't know why an accident occurred then you're in trouble because then you start to lose the confidence within the car and that leads to yourself and that is a downward spiral and can definitely take you out of a season so it's it's let's get a crash you have a crash you understand why you had the crash and then once you understand why you had the crash then it's no problem get back in the car as soon as possible and get back up to speed and that's what you got to do you got to be pretty forgetful about those things <laughs> they always say that short memory for it uh, you know in in all injuries really for sports horse racing you could go on and on the craziest thing is and i don't know if you forecasted this you take this career and parlay it into a second career and you're doing an amazing job thank you let's say that first off what was that transition like wasn't easy <laughs> <laughs> very hard that's a very hard it was a very hard transition mm -hmm. um it's it's a really long story i'll try and make it as short as possible uh when recession when the recession hit um the team that i was racing for we lost our funding and i was sort of without a ride because teams at that point were bringing on drivers who were paying for their seats and so if you don't have any money to pay for your seat, then you're kind of useless at that point, even though you are very talented, it's, it's, it's time to move on and they're going to get someone who's got money. So the so recession hit, lost my job, lost my, yeah, lost my job, um, moved back home with my parents, <laughs> uh, out in the middle of, uh, Keene, Ontario, which is in the middle of, you know, nowhere, <laughs> nothing against Keene. Love it there. Still go back. Um, but I worked at a chicken farm uh, during the day to make money, and I delivered pizza at night uh, in a in a city called Peterborough. Um, and that's what I did for about a year. 
uh, until a friend of mine who worked at TSN actually said, hey, why don't you try and come and, you know, work work here? It's, uh, we don't like to see you, you know, you're delivering pizza, dude. Like, what are you doing kind of thing? <laughs> it's like, well, it's like, well, this is my job now. And you know, it was very, uh, it was a really sad time in my life, to be honest with you. It was a very sad time. Um, but I ended up uh, doing like a um, crash course in, in uh, journalism, like really crash course. Like, <laughs> and I worked at the score. I got, a, I got an intern job working at the score doing archives. Okay. And from there, I transitioned over to TSN. And I started doing like production, learning how to write scripts and learning how to edit, do sound stuff. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, like I'm really learning a lot here. And they had Formula One. A lot of my contacts, connections, people who worked, literally people who worked for me <laughs> were now working in Formula One. And so it was, you know, I could just basically uh, ask them. Like, what's going on? Like, what's going on in the paddock? Who's going where? What? Blah, 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 blah. Still kept in touch with everybody. And then on the side, while working at TSN, I was doing brand ambassador work for two car companies, um, making a little extra income on that side. And there was one day I was, like, going through Twitter, and this was around the time, like, Adrian Wojnarowski was doing Woj bombs, they're called. And I was like, wow, what a smart thing to do like this guy's leveraging his contacts people he knows and he's really giving back to like the fans he's got that insidery stuff he's pulling back the curtain on the nba and i'm like well this is really fascinating i'm like i would love to try and do something like that and tsn had formula one so i started putting together like stories based around formula one and i started pitching them to the executives and they started understanding what they had they were like oh wow you know we actually have this and it's really it's interesting once they had somebody who could explain it to them and show them what was going on and they're like hey how would you like to start working on formula one a little more often and i was like that'd be great and so they threw me a bone i grabbed it ran with it and yeah it's uh it's just a growing has grown every single year that i've gotten to sort of do it so Certain aspects of the job have definitely changed, uh, which is great because I'm always learning something different. And I'm now in front of the camera 100% of the time, mm -hmm. where before I started off like way behind the camera mm -hmm. and I never even thought about that. I was just working at TSN to make a living, to pay, pay my bills. Uh, I loved sports and you know, I thought, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll do, I'll do that. I can do my car stuff on the side. They were good with me going and doing that. And then, yeah, once I saw they had Formula One rights and we started putting content together, it just sort of snowballed from there. Clint, it's a really long story. I tried to make it as condensed as possible, but no, it's a, it's an outstanding story, quite honestly, and and it goes to show you about persistence and the fact that you know what, you, you, and you just like I say, you went from the seat to, to holding a microphone and right but you had it you have all that expertise that you had built up the knowledge you had contacts which is a massive thing especially yeah. for auto racing in this country where there are so few of you right like there's so few of you so you, great capitalization was that dan o'toole that helped you out is that was that the guy like, helped, that gave you a little push there was a couple of people behind the scenes that really right. were like very encouraging <laughs> of of being like, hey, you should definitely pitch these ideas and you should see where they go. And there was quite a few people who worked with inside TSN who were huge motorsports fans. And once they started to learn, you know, who I was and my background, because I, I was pretty uh, private about, about that. Mm -hmm. um, but once I started to sort of you know, get to know everybody. Then I could start to tell them people. Some people didn't believe me. They had to Google me, and then they <laughs> find who I was. And then, so it was stuff like that. You know, that happened in there as well. It was, it was pretty cool, I guess. Um, but for, I think for me in particular, um, I just wanted to. I, I was in a place where 
I guess like my, oh God, I want to be so dramatic, but like my heart was broken because I, of how my career ended and mm -hmm. I didn't know how to sort of repair it, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. And it took me a few years to sort of like understand of my accomplishments that I had done, come to the realization that I did something that not a lot of people in this world get to do. And I worked really hard at trying to do it. And I gave everything that I had to get to that point which was a, a very hard. It was a huge part of my life. I sacrificed to, to go and do it. You know, university, college, time with friends, lost all that stuff. You know, a lot of the guys I grew up with, I wish I could still have kept in touch with, but like you sort of lose them along the way because you're so engrossed and focused on trying to become a professional racing driver that, you know, sometimes things like that happen, unfortunately. And so it, it, it for me, working at TSN, really looking at formula one that Woj stuff and then just started like getting that passion for motorsports back and like the love for it and remembering why i i did what i did when i was like nine years old is was was huge for me that was massive um and i just wanted to share i guess my passion for the sport with everybody else and you know, get new fans on board and sharing people's love for and passion for motorsports in this country. So I guess that that basically is where it sort of sort of went to, I guess. Well, I think it's an amazing story, right? Because sometimes we got to hit rock bottom, right? Like sometimes it happens, but <laughs> I mean, but it, you turned it into a, a major, major plus, you know, and we watch your, you know, your, the, the work that you do. Montreal, Mm. What a huge success that was. I mean, oh, what man, a great awesome. race. You get the weather involved. You get different tire strategies going on. Amazing race. Did the right person win? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say, like, I mean, Verstappen's a deserving champion for sure, Clint. I mean, that is Max really just, you know, wrestling away a win from two other drivers actually more than that probably three other drivers potentially four um when you really break it all down it was a great it was a great race man like almost five drivers competing for a win i mean this is what we've wanted for so long um having this regulation and then starting the season with with this regulation and thinking that red bull had still had a huge advantage when i was in bahrain i was I was a little nervous about this season being another sort of, you know, walk away for Verstappen, but I didn't believe it. I didn't believe that these teams couldn't close the gaps and I just, I just didn't believe it. And so I thought like by the time we got to race seven, eight, I, I knew that teams were going to catch up and you know, I was a little sweating at, at the time, <laughs> but uh, thankfully they did <laughs> and proved, proved me right. Mm -hmm. um, but it's great to see because now when we go to other races, we're not going to know who's going to win. I mean, Barcelona may be a Red Bull track, but from there on out, I mean, I, I, no one's going to know who's going to win. There's, there's, there's no way. Um, your, your favorite's always going to be Max coming in, but you now have, you know two, three teams factor in Mercedes uh, that are going to be able to put pressure on them for, for race wins now. Um, yeah, Canada was awesome. It was a ton of fun. Best race I've seen in a while, for sure. Well, and, and I think that's what we want. We want the mystery, right? Like, I mean, yeah. you're right. Max came out on top and, and deserved the win, I thought. Yeah. But we want that mystery, that, that, that who we're not quite sure. We're not quite sure. <laughs> and, you know, because it, it – I tell people all the time and they say, some people say, well, you know, I enjoy it, but the same person's winning. And I say, well, you know what? I've been watching Formula One for years and there's always dominance. Like there's always going to be a dominance. And, but then you throw in some other factors sometimes and it can get really, really entertaining. And I think that is exactly, you know, what we saw in, in, in Montreal. Yeah. I, I think like the, the, the help from the regulation, um, and Liberty Media, like understanding the fact that like F1 has been about, you know, who can, you know, who has the best driver, who has the best engineers, who has the most money and who can develop the car the best. 
Now, Liberty Media, when they came in, they bought Formula One, they got everybody to sign up to a new Concord agreement, then they started looking at the sport being like, hey, like, we got to make the stuff happening at the front of the field, like, uh, way, way more exciting. We need to get other teams involved, because you have 10 teams here, all of them have great stories, and we need them to get further up the grid. We need to tell those stories. And I think when they came up with the regulation for 2022, and then we had two years of it already. We're coming into its third year. And seeing that the regulation they had developed has played out the way they wanted it to speaks to the volumes that now we can start looking at Formula One differently as a sport when we don't always get domination. I mean, when 2026 hits with a new set of regulations, I mean, at that point, we're probably going to see dominance for a couple of seasons until everybody else sort of closes the gap and we get convergence again. But now we have convergence so soon within the regulation. I mean, this has worked out better than I think they even thought it was going to. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, again, you you want to get, and I think that's what's great about Mercedes kind of coming back a little bit, McLaren doing their thing. And, you know, who knows what's going to happen for the constructors, quite honestly. I think the driver's thing, as we know, pretty much done but the constructor is going to be really fun to watch yeah. running short on time but i got to throw you this this question here um we also come from a time where f1 and what we'll call champ car at the time mm-hmm. they were going head to head especially yeah. in north america sure. is there an opportunity for indy to close that gap as we'll say um that's a great question you know i would look at it so if we look at oh how do i want to compare this so I would say they're probably, in terms of television viewership, at the moment in the United States, they're on par with each other. I would say they're they're pretty equal in terms of the, the ratings. Sometimes IndyCar gets a little bit more. Sometimes F1 gets a little bit more. And in Canada, it's like Formula One is a massive sport here. Like, it is huge in Canada. Like, our, like the ratings that we got on the weekend for the canadian grand prix was a record it's up five percent from last year it's like 1.4 million uh folks on average tuned in 3.5 million was the peak and then you take a look at what's going on down you know in the states and that's around 1.7 million they have and then you look at per capita how many people we have in canada compared to how many people live in the united states and you can see that it is a much bigger um, sport here mm-hmm. at the moment. I would say IndyCar is trailing behind for sure. Um, even though IndyCar is great racing, and I think drivers just as good, it's the fact that it's not like the people who run the Toronto Indy do a great job of promoting the Toronto Indy and getting that ready. I would say IndyCar could probably do a little more work up here as well to build its fan base, but it really they really focus on the United States. Well, I'll tell you, Tim, we look forward to your work. We look forward to obviously more races on TSN. I, I'll tell you something for me, people, you know, you see people that PVR the sport. I'm up. I love waking up early in the morning <laughs> on a Sunday for a race and obviously for qualifying. I know you do too. You there. And I, I think like I said, oh, yeah. we'll continue the little tweets back and forth <laughs> and when things are, are really exciting, but nonetheless, congratulations on all what you're doing. It was great to really catch up with you and, and understand where you've come from uh, in this sport and what you're continuing to do and provide. It's only going to get bigger and bigger. Let's know that. Let's just see that. That right now because formula one especially is certainly riding a high so nonetheless though thank you for joining us on the sports line podcast really appreciate your time fella all right clint thanks so much for having me i really do appreciate it there you go yet another success story on the sports line podcast if you do know of an athlete team or event that deserves some attention we're here for you look us up on many of chch's social media platforms and while you're at it please comment subscribe and blast that thumbs up button because we do appreciate your feedback for the outstanding minds and hands that make this sports line podcast possible thank you so much and we'll see you next week